introduction. So today, okay, yeah. Uh, so oh, I have to do something. I got it. Okay. Uh, so today we're very happy to have uh, uh David uh to give us a uh, uh, um a talk on the factorial homology. So we're very glad to have him here because he's a uh, uh, one of the co-founder of the subject. Especially, uh, he developed this uh, so-called beta version of factorial homology, uh, which is um, slightly different, not slightly, quite different from the uh, uh, the alpha version. Uh, so, and uh, we we believe that the the theory they developed is a highly uh, uh, deeply uh, related to what the physicists are had in mind and what the physics really need. So uh, we're really happy to have him uh, to give us this talk, uh, introductory talk on uh, factorial homology. Yeah, uh, David, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for this invitation. Um, so I'll talk about factorization homology. Um, I'll be upfront that I, I made some guesses for how to speak to this particular audience. And uh, please, as I go at any time, ask questions. And, and I have plenty more to say, I'm sure, in response to those questions. Um, I especially welcome that so that the talk is engaging to, to more folks. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, also before I say too much more, I'm eager to better understand just how to prepare this theory for applications in physics. And um, and so if if any of you today um, have any comments along those lines, I especially welcome that. So most of this work is joint with John Francis, um, my ongoing collaborator, and uh, other aspects are also joint with two other collaborators, Nick Rosenblum, who's an expert in derived algebraic geometry and deformation theory, and Aaron Maiselge, um, who in a sense was an early student of mine. Okay, so factorization homology. So what it is, is a construction. Uh, here's the input. There's two types of input. One is a manifold. And that manifold, typically, I think of it as n-dimensional. But it's interesting and worthwhile to entertain uh, cases where uh, the manifold has dimension less than n. Additionally, um, for much of the theory, there's what's called a framing. And we can go into that if appropriate. But I'll mostly ignore that particular bit of structure. Um, if I, depending on where we go to in this talk today, uh, when I outline a definition of factorization homology, it, it will be clear how the framing is used here. Uh, but I think that uh, that that framing structure could be relieved with some uh, some more thought. Intuitively, uh, in physics, I encourage you to think of this as a domain of a QFT, um, or possibly the bulk of a QFT or of a TQFT that's acting on a QFT. Uh, and we might go into that. So that's one ingredient for the input. Another, and I'm aware that this is a lot of technical words, and so I intend to elaborate on it a little bit more. The other input is a, um, I'll, I'll highlight as we go, the, uh, the main bit of structure. Uh, the other input is a, Um, is an infinity n category. Um, now, I <laughs> the number of mathematicians who are experts in homotopy theory that have a working practice with infinity n categories is very small. Uh, so I'm going to outline what I mean by this uh, and how to produce examples of such below. Now, um, an additional condition on them is that they be what's called rigid. And think of that as a type of finite, finiteness condition. And uh, 
we also choose an object that we usually think of as the unit um, inside of, of it. Okay. There's more words here. Enriched over V. And uh, here are some cases for what that V is. V could be complex vector spaces. Or it could be chain complexes over C. Or it could be sets. Or it could be spaces. And I considered, uh, and I always consider just writing a talk and even a paper where I just fix one of these choices once and for all. But there's advantage to having a multitude of options there uh, for some of the examples that I'll <clears throat> bring up. You know, just a little bit. Okay. May, so, ask, may I ask why you put the pointer there? Yeah, yeah. I'll um, um. So I'll say now, and uh, I hope to come back to this a little later when okay. we talk about the definition. The point will enable us to evaluate on non-compact manifolds. It, it's kind of like uh, the point at infinity. So this has everything to do with. Uh, these being not possibly not compact. If you want a theory for only compact manifolds, you could not ever mention the point. Um, okay, so it, it's a really small piece of, uh, of structure, but we'll see how it comes up in just a little bit. Um, now, intuitively, whatever on earth this mathematical structure is, and the data of it is an n category that's enriched in, say, vector spaces, and uh, that's a condition of it. It organizes the point, uh, the point, the topological point operators, and it how they interact themselves with the topological line operators and how those interact with the topological surface operators, et cetera. So this mathematical structure is intended to capture, uh, inspired by physics, all of the topological operators of all possible dimensions and co-dimensions, and furthermore, how they interact with each other. It's just remarkable that this pre-existing mathematical structure, an N category, has very much to do with uh, uh, these topological operators in a physical theory. Okay, so, so that's the input to factorization homology. It's a manifold and it's an N category. Um, and you can think of the manifold again as a domain of a QFT. And this n category is somehow organizing the point and line, et cetera, topological operators. Okay, so what's the output of this construction? The output is an object in that in V. So uh, the best case to take, as I'll mention in a second, is where V is chain complexes, in which case factorization homology will be a chain complex. And a way to think about it is it is all possible observables or operators, at least those that are topological. It organizes all of them. So that's what this talk is about. It's about this construction. And I'll just make a comment in real time here is, um, there's a lot of shadows of this construction. Uh, the more I, I read other people's works that are have to do with mathematics of theoretical physics, the more shadows of this I've seen. And if I were to identify what the, the new aspect of this theory is, um, it's really that it's it's derived. Um, and And I'll elaborate what I mean by that, but it is a construction that makes no choices, such as it, it does not make a choice of a triangulation of M in order to define this, and then later have to show that 
that this construction was independent of that choice. So I'll just note this, that uh, the advantage here, the, the key novelty is that uh, this, this construction is manifestly well-defined. So no choice, no triangulation, et cetera, and it's also derived. And I'll, I'll speak to the advantages of derived in just a moment. Okay, so that's, that's factorization homology. As I mentioned, typically, we're, the, the enrichment is in chain complexes, and I invite you to just uh, think, uh, think of that example from here on out. Um, and typically, uh, one is interested in the zeroth homology of this chain complex, which will be a vector space. So, um, as we will see in just a bit, uh, if one is only interested in the zeroth homology of a chain complex, uh, there's still advantage in remembering that chain complex, such as for un otherwise unforeseen local to global expressions, such as meyer vittorra sequence, um, and also such as discovering ghost symmetries um, and I'll bring up both of those two points in just a little bit. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this stage? Uh, hi, um, I have two questions. Please. Um, first one is, uh, if it's uh, enriched in chain complex, is a DJ category, and uh, there is another notion of the rigid DJ category in the book of Gansky and Rosenblum. Mm -hmm. Is any relation with that notion um, rigid of, yeah. and this rigid? Yes, uh, they coincide when they're comparable. Uh, so thank you for that, that question. Um, and I'll just, I'll just sneak that in real time, a remark. When n is equal to 1, then some of you might have already known this definition. Um, well, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say n is equal to two actually, and for um, R, um, actually let let's say a a rigid um, uh, DG category, and there what this means is that there's a monoidal structure, and with respect to that monoidal structure, every object has a left and right dual. then you can take its D loop. So this will be a two cat, as we, I'm gonna talk about this in a second, this will be a two category that's rigid. Um, infinity two category. And it will also come with a point. So that's a great source of examples in dimension two. So these Corey Rosenblum in dimension two, uh, for, for rigid DJ categories, that produces examples uh, for n to be two. So a theory for, for us for surfaces. Thanks for that. Uh, Any other comments or questions out there? Uh, uh, and this point is the monodal unit or yes. anything? Oh, I say. Yeah, exactly. That That's why I, I like this notation uh, because it looks like the unit uh, because in practice it will be the unit. Okay, um, here's a, a uh, informal definition of an infinity n category. Um, so you are welcome to just omit this if you like, just for discussion's sake. Um, though, as I indicated above, the real advantage of this theory is that this is all true in a derived setting. And so, um, 
how the most fantastic examples arises by not omitting the infinity. But, but you're still welcome to to get the spirit of what this is. So an infinity n category, or just think n category, it consists of a moduli space of objects. And uh, here's an example. If, um, and I should have said this is an example when n is equal to one. Uh, in that case, you can take, uh, uh, consider the ordinary category of vector spaces, finite dimensional, and the set of objects is the set of finite dimensional vector spaces. And what I mean by the moduli space of objects is, well, the moduli space of finite dimensional complex vector spaces. And one way of describing it is as this co-product of B, G, L, N of Cs. So an infinity n category consists of a moduli space. Think of it as the maximal subgroupoid of a given example, such as, whoops, such as here. Um, and then for every pair of objects, there's a moduli space of one morphisms. And for every pair of one morphisms, there's a moduli space of two morphisms. Etc. And at the very top, uh, for given two n minus one morphisms, there's not a moduli space of n morphisms, but a chain complex of n morphisms. So this is where we see the enrichment. And together with some composition rules. Um, so if you fix a K between zero and N, there's a composition rule like this. And uh, in fact, there's in a sense, um, K minus one types of composition rules for K morphisms. Um, and uh, I, I hope to draw some pictures in a bit to indicate that, that have to do with the surface operators, et cetera. Um, let's see, I just got a prompt, uh, I'll broadcast. Can you still see my, my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Is it moving? No. Uh, no, it's not okay, moving. I need to, to restart Zoom. Uh, my apologies. Oh. It's cut out. It's okay. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why That's that okay. happened. Okay. Um, can yeah. you see the screen and is it moving yeah. now? Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, intuitively, uh, the n morphisms that, um, and the way I'm drawing pictures, n will be two. The n morphisms are the topological point operators in the theory. 
so uh, here's a surface uh, and given two points, uh, you can think of them as sites for inserting a point operator. Um, and actually this way of talking about uh, the endomorphisms is only valid if there are n endomorphisms of that special point that we chose. So think of the unit. Um, n minus one morphisms, uh, you can think of as topological line operators, um, et cetera. Let me draw a couple more pictures. So here's here's a more complicated uh, network on a surface, and um, one can think. So if uh, uh, let's call this um, uh, let's call this. alpha, x, y, z, what's happening in this site here is locally, it looks like this picture. Um, which I can interpret as, as a, a morphism from, if I read the, you can see where framing is used on the manifold. So moving upward, I see y first and then x. So this is like x tensor y alpha to z. Is that <clears throat> that kind of structure? So um, what I'm indicating here is intuitively how to think of uh, an n category in terms of uh, topological operators on it. Uh, on a on a manifold. So you're suggesting that uh, um, this framing tell you the order of the tensor product. That's right. Um, uh, but but what if you have a uh, x y lying uh, horizontally in uh, the first direction, not uh, in the vertical direction, but in the, yeah, good. Then you you then you have a you want to use the second tensor product? Right. So it, in a sense, we could. Um, so so this picture, we can, is is kind of isotopic to this one. Mm -hmm. Oops. Which is in turn isotopic to this picture. So these string diagrams may look entirely familiar. Mm -hmm. And I can just relabel this by not Y, but Y with its, I'll just call it Y dual. And that I can interpret as a morphism from X to mm -hmm. uh, Z tensor Y dual. Okay. Um, so good thing we're in a rigid category. Uh, rigidness was a condition that I, I, I didn't uh, say for that definition up there. Um, mm -hmm. So that this kind of maneuver can is is allowable. Mm -hmm. So we still use the framing, but what we're in a sense observing is that. Um, uh, well, anyway, so it was. What this comment I hope it's it's illustrating is that uh, uh, we, we we're still using the framing, um, though these these kind of interpretations as alluded to here are invariant with respect to isotopy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so all told, we should, however we're interpreting these these pictures, it should be such that these two data are the same, and in a in a you know in a monoidal category in which every object has a dual, uh, they indeed are the same data.
Okay, so uh, what I had in mind is that that would be as much as I'll say for the time being about the definition of an N category. Um, certainly, I'm happy to go into a rigorous definition or just more intuitions as we like. Um, barring any comments, I'll move on. Um, I thought I would say some examples and computations um, before I talk about features of factorization homology. So if right now you're feeling, or you're just wondering what are, uh, well, I, I figured to get a sense of what factorization homology is, we can see some easy computations to start, to start, to start out with. Um, so one, and I'm bringing this one up first because um, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. But uh, even only it's the oh, recording, it's okay. But it said recording failed to start. Uh, so from your screen. I yeah. Think it's from his screen. So from from our screen. side, it seems okay. 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 For some reason, uh, my my feature of using the highlighter is not working, uh, but that's okay. Okay, so uh, why this theory is, has the word homology in it? Um, one reason, one explanation of that is that homology is an instance of factorization homology. So I'll just mention that real quick. If you fix an abelian group A, you can construct a space, which is the Eilenberg McLean space for it. And there's a few standard notations for that. One is BNA, another is KAN. And a feature is that this is a pointed space with homotopy groups that are either zero or A. And it's A in the named degree, and it's zero in all others. Um, and there's a standard way of regarding a space as an infinity n category in a very trivial way. Uh, the space of objects is BA, BNA, and the space of one morphisms is the path space, and the space of two morphisms are the space of maps from a two dimensional disk into BNA, etc. So there's a, a natural way of regarding every space as an infinity n category, and it will always be uh, rigid, uh, it turns out. And because uh, this space is pointed, then so will the associated infinity n category. Um, now, it turns out that factorization homology uh, of it is a moduli space of A-labeled finite subsets of M. So here's a way of indicating what it is. A point in there is a finite subset of M together with a map from that finite subset to A. And here's what a picture looks like. And I hope this is commensurate feeling with the picture I mentioned a moment ago of uh, point observables. So in a sense, we're thinking of this abelian group as um, as the point observables in this very trivial theory. May, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, I, my, my knowledge about this integral is that uh, if you uh, will be able to integrate over uh, a manifold or even on a, a disk, you probably should require uh, the the integrand to be a uh, uh, in algebra in some sense, but but what in this a B and A, um, what in what sense it is a uh, in algebra? Yeah, thanks. or um, or am I in a or okay. is you mean something totally different? No, that that's a great question. I was gonna say a word about it in a moment, but I'd rather respond to the questions as they come. So here's some examples. Here's some examples of how to construct infinity n categories. Um, so let 
uh, let, let's say, G be a group, then there's a construction, BG, and that's an infinity one category. And it's in fact pointed. And what is it? The moduli space of objects? There's a few ways of saying this, and I'll say the most intuitive one is point. And the one morphisms in this category from point to point is equal to G. And the composition rule is equal to the multiplication rule of G. Um, and this is pretty general. So more generally, let uh, C be uh, a monoidal uh, one category. Then there's a way to regard it as a two category. BC, this is a, a infinity two category. And it will be pointed as well. Uh, and there's a few ways of describing what the moduli space of objects is, and one is just as point. And the one palm in this construction from point to point is the moduli space of objects of C. And the two hum um, from C to D is the one hum in C from C to D. And you can see this is pointed as well. And uh, it turns out, I name this as a fact, but it's an easy fact once one knows the definition of rigid, is that BC is rigid if and only if every um, object, oh, whoops, I forgot to say what the composition rule is. Composition is the tensor product in C. So that's where we use the monodal structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's rigid if and only if every object in C has a left and right dual. So that's a great way of producing examples of infinity two categories um, from monoidal one categories. And this is more general, even still, is mm -hmm. let um, A be an EK algebra in infinity N minus K categories. Um, in other words, it's a EK monoidal um, <clears throat> N minus K category. Mm -hmm. Then there's a similar construction. You can de-loop three times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this will be an infinity N category, which is in fact pointed. Mm -hmm. And there's a similar fact is that if A as a is rigid as a uh, infinity n minus k category and as a uh, monodal category. you can just look at the underlying one category, but then that's the same as B at BKA being rigid. Uh, and to finish this example, um, if this is an unfamiliar phrase, so my highlighter is dead for some reason. Oh, no, there we go. Uh, 
if EK monoidal category is an unfamiliar phrase, it might be more uh, familiar uh, by these two comments. An E1 monoidal um, infinity one category is the same thing as just a monoidal infinity one category. And secondly, is that an E2 monoidal infinity one category, and that in fact just Uh, one category is the same thing as a braided monoidal one category. So this might be a familiar uh, notion, um, namely braided monoidal categories. And that turns out to be the same as an E2 monoidal category. So I'm giving context to this uh, general notion of an EK monoidal category. And as an extreme case of this, if K equals N, we see that in particular uh, for a, a an EN algebra, then this d loop, the n-fold d loop, will be an example of a pointed infinity n category that's uh, that uh, the condition of being rigid is, is vacuous, so it'll always be rigid. So uh, if an en algebra is a familiar thing, uh, then uh, that's great because you automatically have a large supply of examples of pointed n categories, namely ar those that arise from their um, n-fold d-loop. And if I'm going to name one other fact, um, an en algebra is the same thing as a Poisson um, on n shifted, or actually n minus one shifted Poisson algebra, which is a commutative algebra um, and a n minus one shifted Lie algebra. And for this to make sense, it's got to be in a DG setting. And then such that uh, that the uh, Lie algebra structure is a derivation with respect to the commutative algebra structure. So, um, so Poisson, al Poisson algebras therefore give examples of infinity n categories that are rigid. Uh, thanks for that comment. I was going to mention something along those lines in a bit. Uh, but it's great to have it now. Are there any questions before I move on to some computations and examples? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Okay, uh, just uh, as you have just explained, uh, given an EN algebra A, we can construct a pointed infinite N category, BNA, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, now, uh, can we compare the results of uh, we can take factor division homology of A and we can take factor division homology of BA. So the result is the same. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this is this is not definitional, it's a theorem. And it can be simply stated like this, A over M. And I'm gonna tag this with an alpha version as in like the, the first model of like, you know, yeah. uh, and that's equivalent with this data version for BNA. <laughs> that's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I ask another question? Yeah, please. Uh, so given a pointed infinite n category, 
and I think we can construct an uh, which is enriched in uh, V, okay, uh, where V is a symmetric monoidal infinite category. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we can construct an ENA algebra in, in V by taking the home category of this, uh, this distinguished object iteratively. Uh, yeah. So what is the result of the uh, the two factor division homologies? Uh, the first is yeah. we take. Uh, okay, I think you can understand my question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So so let um this be a pointed infinity n category enriched in V. Then one can extract from it the n endomorphisms of that point and the composition rule will endow this so this is a chain complex or in generally this is in uh, not some object in v but the composition rules give this uh, uh an n minus one sphere worth of uh, composition rules and and really what i mean is this this will have the structure of an en algebra in v. <laughs> Um, so now one can, and, and furthermore, if there's a functor, which is, in fact, this is fully faithful, uh, with image, um, everything isomorphic to point to, to the, the unit, to the flex out that component. And as a, we will discuss, I hope in a moment, that induces a map on factorization homology. So I'm gonna use the above fact. So the alpha version to the beta version. And that is not a, an equivalence generally. Okay, I see, thank you. Yeah, uh, could well, you... can I? Well, go ahead. So, so, uh, so this, this is, is... Is there any results telling us uh, when is this guy an equivalence? Um, this induced the map. Yeah, I, I really appreciate these questions because uh, it's giving me feedback on, on what, what to focus on. Um, so, uh, there's another theorem that, um, as, uh, I think I'll mention in a little bit, uh, for M compact, uh, or, or closed and N dimensional, um, note that I said it can be evaluated on less than N dimensional things. Then there's Merida invariance. Um, that if R and R prime have the same categories of modules, then that implies uh, factorization homology for them are the same. Um, I, now I bring this up because uh, as an example, um, so if you fix, let's say that's a, a, a uh, uh, an associative algebra, a ring, or DGA, um, then you can look at BNK, and that maps to perfect modules for K, as does endomorphisms of any perfect module. And both of these are Merida equivalences. And that means factorization homology of all of these things are indistinguishable. And I should have said this is non-zero for the K module. So, so that, so if, um, 
if R is not necessarily equal to the n endomorphisms of its unit, but if it's Merida equivalent to it, for instance, if um, uh, so I'll say what it is. If um, perf, and so this is some, uh, an n categorical version of perf. If perf of that en uh, uh, en algebra is Merida equivalent with R, or for instance, if R is just equal to perf of it, then then you get the same answer. That um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, uh, so you. David. Oh, yes, so the, um, the, I, I still have some trouble to understand the beta version. I sort of uh, know this alpha version. So the beta, uh, uh, so I, I'm guessing that the beta version is that you can, uh, you should consider M with, uh, with a stratified manifold, uh, strat uh, some stratum, and you decorate it by um, some uh, 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 lower morphism of R. Is that, yeah. is that what you, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe, however, oh, go ahead. However, if that is the case, then I am uh, even got more puzzled because um, uh, the integral, it, in order to define the integral, you need to specify which stratum was decorated by which object in R, right? But uh, but if you just write integral like that, I wasn't able to tell uh, which stratum is decorated by which object in R or which uh k morphism of r how to see this this integral beta version is well defined yeah I, I think i understand that question um uh so so maybe i'll, I'll outline a definition of factorization homology now um and let me just just comment that um uh um yeah i'll do that right now Um, so, uh, so here's a definition. Um, the first part of the definition, um, is, uh, the, it's the construction of a category. So what, what is this? This is a, uh, and it's it's naturally going to be an infinity one category. Though I I if infinity categories are unfamiliar to you, I encourage you to just pretend that infinity is not there. Um, so what is this infinity category? Um, an object is. Um, is a disk stratification of M. And uh, what's meant by this is quite specific. Um, I'll draw some pictures because I think that captures the spirit. Um, so let's say I'll draw some pictures when N is equal to two. Um, and imagine we're just looking at a patch of M. A disk stratification then is, well, it's a stratification of M by um, which looks something like this. And now you might know enough about a theory of stratifications to appreciate that without some regularity conditions, stratifications can be really wild. Like there could be, like we wanna avoid infinite spirals and, and stuff like that. So uh, a triangulation of M is just fine, is an example of such that has a suitable regularity. And you know, M is framed here. <clears throat> so, 
I'm indicating a distratification right now. Notice that um, it consists of points, um, edges, and little polygonal surfaces. Those polygonal surfaces need not be triangles. Uh, they could be, uh, but they need not be. Um, so that's roughly what, a, a picture of what an object in this category is. It's a stratification. Um, what's a morphism? A morphism, or I'll say the morphisms, in M, uh, in disk of M, are generated by, and I'm going to name a couple classes of morphisms, and every morphism will be a composition of these. So one type is just um, an isotopy of disk stratifications. Um, so like you might see a local picture that looks like this, oops. Um, and it just kind of might move, but the combinatorics of the stratification remain unchanged. So I, I just wiggled these dots around a little bit. The combinatorics did not change of that disk stratification. Um, another type of oops, another type of move is uh, a um, an anti collision. of a strata. So what that might look like is, if here's a piece of the stratification, um, we might see a movie um, where you see that horizontal line break up into two parallel lines. So if you read the movie backwards in time, you see these two lines, uh, these two lines, they collide to that one if you read backwards in time. So a forward morphism is an anti-collision. And the last type of move is a, uh, a refinement. And by that, I mean, oops. So this might look familiar from Fokker moves. So we, uh, we just remove a stratum. So those, those are the, the morphisms in this category. Uh, I'll, I'll say as a remark, um, this does not look like it's a rigorous definition of anything. And one way to define this rigorously is to define this as a stack on stratified spaces, where you say that an S point of it is a stratification of M cross S whose fibers over S are disk stratifications. Essentially, that's it. And uh, we, we prove that um, given a stack on stratified spaces, one can construct an infinity category from it, which is essentially the exit path category of that stack. But anyway, so it, it captures this intuition. So I'm I'm answering your your question still, going. So this is a first step: is what is disk of M? So again, it's a entire it's a whole infinity category in which an object is essentially a triangulation of M. Mm -hmm. That's a point in this category. Mm -hmm. And now next uh, is that there's a fantastic functor.
proxy, and, and if you were wondering why the variance above, um, it was uh, anyway. It, it, so that this <laughs> this is contravariant to um, infinity n categories. And how is it given? Well, you're we're pretty much looking at the definition. It it you can imagine how this goes. I should is what I mean. Given a polygon, so I'm looking at a little local picture of a distratification. You're staring at an n category, at, in this case, a two category. And here's where you use the framing. What is this two category? The dots will be the objects. The edges will be the arrows. And to know which way the arrows go, you make use of the first direction uh, with your, of the framing. You might be wondering if, if an edge was vertical with respect to the framing, what direction does that edge go? And uh, this is all in, in some kind of infinity sense. And you just tilt the triangulation or distratification so that it, it all the edges map uh, isomorphically, they project to the first coordinate direction of the framing. And the two morphisms are in the second direction. So I'm given a distratification, which I think triangulation, you can build uh, an end category from it. So we use the letter C for like the category associated to a distratification. And making this well-defined is also its own enterprise, but um, uh, in a sense, this intuitive way of discussing it makes it uh, less obvious how to make this rigorous. There's a, a slick, uh, so, so I'll make another remark kind of for the experts that, um, uh, really, we construct a functor from theta n, which is known to be a parametrizing. It's known to parametrize infinity n categories. We construct a functor from that into disks. And then what frac C is, is just a restricted Yoneda functor. So, yeah, and, it, and it reports the values as indicated here. Now, finally, the last part of the definition is finally the definition it's, it's the co-limit of this composite functor disk of m it forgets to infinity n categories or it maps there by that map from point two just above uh, to the op and then there's a functor to V, which assigns to infinity n category, hom between infinity n categories from C to R. So that's why there's the, the opposite here. So all told, this, <clears throat> this sends a distratification V of M to uh, to the collection of functors, I'll denote it more informally like this, from the category you associate to D, so such as this picture, to R. Now, look, like in thinking about what such a functor is. Well, we it's an assignment of the objects uh, in to the objects in R. I'm oh, a little please. confused about the uh, this uh, paragraph. Uh, the the parentheses D dot F M. What, what is 
What is that? This notation? But, uh, I might forgot it. Uh, oh no, thank you. I said of or the, a dis a disk stratification. Oh okay. This oh, of M. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. This stratification of M. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then you got. I see. Uh huh. Right. So this is essentially like a so. Such a thing here is so uh, assignment of objects of this right, thing. Right. So a, a, right. Yeah. Please go ahead. So so this functor C is basically uh give you a decoration of uh, uh give you some somehow a, a labeling of uh, if I call the target target category the, the category of uh, uh the category infinity n category um to be the um, uh, a category of certain defect of certain quantum field system. So this, this uh, the first C, the C functor is basically give you a, a decoration of yeah. all the stratum, right? That's precisely what it is, that's right. Then, okay. Uh, then what is R? R is, uh, so R is a coefficient system. Yeah, that's right. So think of it as like um, uh, rep, um, you know, uh, complex, like uh, of something, something uh. or something like that. So, so in that case, this would select out for every dot. It would select out a rep, a G rep presentation, and for every arrow. It would select out a linear a, a G equivariant map, linear map, mm -hmm. and that that was a bad example for me to throw out there because it's it's a one category, not a two category. But um, but it's okay. So you're that's basically means that everything everything in that uh, stratified picture, uh, basically you you wanna uh, you wanna say the G acts on everywhere. In uh, for this example, yeah, um, yeah. So while you were talking, I upgraded it to make it the right dimension by taking a D. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So so there, um, let's decorate this. So um, each, uh, so here's a bit of a of a disk stratification, and we label each of these by the unique object, which is point. So that's no data. We'd label each arrow by an, by a object in this category, which is a G rep. So G acts on a vector space V, okay. G acts on another vector space W, et cetera. And then uh, and then uh, uh, what this such a labeling such such a functor here does to the two cell is um, is it's the the data of a map from so from the composite of these to the composite of those and now because we're in a D loop the composite of one morphisms is simply the tensor product so it's this is a G equivariant map from the tensor product of U, W, V to the tensor product of A and B. So that's what uh, this would be in for that example of R and for this particular disk uh, disk piece of a disk stratification so your your i heard you say a comment and that was exactly right which is that um so this functor assigns to a an object here which is like the triangulation of m it assigns to it 
the collection of all, the vector space of all ways of labeling that distratification by your input, your coefficient and category. And by labeling, I mean the dots by objects, the edges by morphisms, the two cells by two morphisms, et cetera, all compatibly. OK. Uh, can, can I also uh, uh, go back to the, uh, the, um, the, the the three type of morphism you showed uh, in the DSCAM? Yes. Uh, yeah. There is anti-collisions, there is a refinement. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, isotopy of distratification, I, I, well, that will match to some kind of a morphism, isomorphism in, in, the, in, in the target. That's, that's OK, I guess. Mm -hmm. But the anti-collision, what what kind of a what was the image of anti-collision uh, of strata? Um, I was just commenting here that the isotopies that watch sticks rotate around. Right. Okay. Use the rigidity. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, and now, uh, the anti-collisions correspond to just duplication to units. So if I happen to label this. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, I got you, I got you, I got you. Yeah, yeah. duplicates of units. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I the, thought this uh, needs some kind of a co-product. Oh, okay. No, okay. Right. And then this, this has to do with composition. So if you're Yeah, given... yeah. Yeah, refinement just do, uh, doing composition. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. These are great, great questions. That, um, I... I had in mind, but but, but wait, but, but anti collision involves some choices, right? It, uh, it it depends on where uh, the, you you put uh identity morphism somewhere, but I thought you have some choices to make. Uh, for example, you can you can let the the bottom one to be the identity, or you let the top one to be the identity, right? There, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I think. That question is generated by uh, just some. Um, so so here, um, V is labeling the edge, uh -huh. and and here V is also labeling that that edge and that edge. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's the two cell that's labeled. I see. By I see. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and if that was even X and Y. Uh, this would remain X. That would remain X. Okay. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I missed that. So okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. No. These are awesome questions. I, I appreciate it. So uh, I want. I to have a, another question. So so yeah. this number three, when M is a Riemann surface, uh, it's going to be a scan algebra. Um. Uh. Yes. Uh. So so in general, it'll be a scan category. Yeah. I, are you going to keep this example from I, I had in mind talking about that. That's right. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll wait for it. Well, I um, it was going to be a, a, a quick pass. Um, so maybe when uh, I'll get to it in a moment. And, and if there's some specific questions you have that remain, we can talk about those. So I, I okay, was thank you. say a heuristic here uh, in this co-limit, um, uh, this is the vector space. Or, or chain complex um, that's generated by, I mean, it, it has a huge generating set. It's generated by all labelings of disk stratifications. of M and then subject to relations given by the above morphisms slash moves that we just talked about up here, those three types. And I don't mean literally quotient out by those relations, but do it in a homologically sensitive way. and. Again, that it is making this kind of construction rigorous that is is really what 
the novelty is that we're bringing here is that it, it's a so this this co-limit in this land of infinity categories is so smart. It's implementing this intuitive idea perfectly. Okay. Um, well, I I am appreciating these questions a great deal. Um, I'll I'll continue with what I had in mind, though. Please continue to speak up, and uh, and I can opt to skip some things based on interest. So, uh, the first example I wanted to talk about was how um, factorization homology generalizes homology, and um, to see that one can take an abelian group, regard it as an en algebra, de-loop it to regard it as an n category, and then take factorization homology of it. And that has a description as a moduli space of points labeled by elements in that abelian group. And I hope that this rings a bell to the the informal discussion about uh, uh, topological point operators. And it turns out it's a theorem of dold Kahn in algebraic topology that the homotopic groups of this space are precisely the homology groups of the manifold with coefficients in A. So it's in that sense that factorization homology generalizes homology. So when the coefficients are that of the n-fold d-loop of an abelian group, uh, it recovers homology. And uh, there's a theorem that we prove that which states that uh, that factorization homology also computes the compactly supported mapping space. And you might know also from obstruction theory and algebraic topology that the homotopy groups of compact supported mapping spaces into an eilenberg maclean space compute uh, the reduced homology of the one-point compactification, or, or sorry, reduced cohomology. So putting all this together, one this computation here is uh, implementing point cray duality, an isomorphism between homology and cohomology. So um, I think there's two takeaways from this. One from this example, one is that <clears throat> factorization homology generalizes homology, and the other is. Um, factorization homology tends to capture mapping spaces. And um, uh, if these seem very different to you, and you're wondering what's the intuition for why these are the same, besides point query duality, uh, choose a triangulation of M. And using that an eilenberg maclean space is n minus 1 connected, you can choose a null homotopy of any such map restricted to the n minus 1 skeleton. In other words, a compact supported map from M to an eilenberg maclean space up to homotopy is supported in a tiny neighborhood of the centers of the end cells of a triangulation. And it's, that ultimately is what this looks like. Anyway, here's another uh, computation, which is that the factorization homology over the circle is Hochschild homology. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just kind of leave this short. Uh, unless there are questions. I'll use it though to mention a structure. Um, so given what I just said, uh, factorization homology over the circle of the R equivariant or the, the linear endomorphisms of a perfect R module from what I just said, that's the Hochschild complex. 
and Hochschild complexes are Morita invariant. So that also, so that means this factorization homology agrees with factorization homology simply over R. So this is a shadow of the Morita invariance I mentioned earlier, which is Morita invariance of Hochschild complex. And in terms of like <clears throat> point operators and stuff, um, you know, if somehow like the the overall observables or, or state space is V, that we can insert these point operators, which are endomorphisms of V, and we get a global observable as the trace of the composite of those endomorphisms. So did this can be understood as the S1 compassion quantum field theory. Uh, can you say that question again? Didn't quite follow. So, so did, did this can be understood as a S one compactation of the 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 QFT you consider? It it could be. Um, yeah. He, okay. So here here I was taking the the theory was actually already just one dimensional. And, yeah. And yeah, okay. and then it would be a compactification just of that. Yeah, but there's, okay. you know, of course, if you have a higher dimensional theory, you can take a compactification along. A lesser dimensional manifold as well. That's yes, also. yes, yes, yes. That's right. So yeah, uh, so so for uh, one dimensional uh, theory, the compa the S one compactification is just the theory of Hochschild homology. Uh -huh. So a question. So uh, the the example you show uh, so far, um, the integration is over in uh, uh, integration over this B. Uh, uh, the de looping space. So in yeah. that sense, uh, the, this this beta version is the same as it uh, can be recovered from the alpha version, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, are you gonna Are you gonna give us a, a non trivial uh, example that uh, will yeah. go beyond the alpha version? Yep. Yeah, I'll do that, uh, and maybe I'll take this as an opportunity to mention that. Um, so, if one takes R, so this is n equals one still. If one takes R to be perf of a, of a ring R, so this is a infinity one category, which is rigid and it's pointed. Um, then one might think that you've got a new, a new value there as the beta factorization homology, let's say over the circle, that's the most interesting compact uh, one manifold. However, um, by Morita invariance still, that's indistinguishable from R. Uh, so you don't get a new value, uh, mm -hmm. but it is a nice way uh, to find even more symmetries. Um, so I'll just mention you, there is a map from objects of R to here, but there's not an obvious map here. Um, so the beta version of factorization homology, which for my own personal history in the context of algebraic K theory and trace methods, um, I was interested in constructing such a map uh, in a derived setting, and it seemed very hard. And so part of the reason that Nick Rosenblum and I even thought of or started thinking about beta factorization homology was in, in order to achieve um, this map, which is ultimately responsible for a trace map of, of K-theory uh, to and then combine it with Morita invariance. So what I'm indicating here in this remark is that even though this value, which is an instance of beta factorization homology, is, um, is not new, it's the same as a previously known value, uh, you get more features, namely there's a, a natural map from the moduli space of R, oops, I said of R, sorry, of, of perf. Every perfect module determines therefore a point in, in the Hochschild complex of R in a, in a derived sense. So, so again, even though it's not a new value, you get more structure from the beta picture. Um, here, here's an example uh, where the truly the beta theory is necessary. Um, 
So um, oh, this is now that I'm looking at it, it's a little bit cluttered. Um, so pick a semi-simple Lie algebra over the complex numbers, G. And you know, I invite you to just think little SL2 of C. And look at the uh, the finite dimensional representations of it. Well, no, actually not over it, but over um, the the quantum group associated to it. So there's a natural deformation, oops, of its, uh, so one can look at the universal enveloping algebra, let's just say a little SL2, and that's the special value, uh, the um, the, the special value of a of a family um, of hop algebras uh, that are all quasi triangular. U Q S L S L two. So this is the quantum group. And one uses the semi-simplicity in a level to figure out what exactly this deformation of that hop algebra is. And what what is meant here by rep Q of G is representations that are finite dimensional of that quasi-triangular hop algebra. that are finite dimensional. <clears throat> um, a theorem of Drinfeld from, I think, 86. <laughs> implies that this, uh, this category of finite dimensional representations for this Hop algebra is um, has the structure of being braided monoidal, and as you recall from an earlier discussion, that's synonymous with saying E two monoidal, and that's the kind of thing that we can take the twofold D loop of, and the result is a uh, is an example of a pointed infinity three category. Um, uh, uh, um, which uh, and because the because we're looking at finite dimensional representations, this infinity three category will be rigid. So the fact that every object in this monodal category has both a left and a right dual is what's responsible for this infinity three category being rigid. So this theory of beta factorization homology reports a chain complex to this. And uh, as, um, as someone was asking about earlier, that recovers the skein module for the three manifold. So the statement in this, we, we hope to post uh, uh, shortly with Francis. When I say shortly, like in the next two months, um, which is that the, the the zeroth homology of this chain complex is the skein module of M. The, 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 how about higher homology group? Yeah, well, uh, uh, so is your question to, to recognize the higher homology? Uh, yes. Terms? Yeah, we, we don't know. Like. Um, and and not because I, so D David Jordan, Sam Gunningham, Pavel Sofronov, um, uh -huh. talking with them has been pretty fruitful. Uh, I they they seem to have an intuition for what the higher homology should be. Um, I see. In it, particular, it, there, there it, it should be some some flow homology, complex uh, complex group crawl homology. I guess. I guess so as well. Um, yeah, I, I and maybe you have some in, 
some I'm aware that some people have some intuition for why that should be so. And yeah, um, I mean, if physics if physics tells us this, yeah, how homology should be flow. Yeah, I mean, this homology group should be isomorphic to the flow homology M three. Yeah, I I, I, I don't I, know. That that's at least physics predicts. I I would I would be interested in in here in in picking up your intuition uh, when I've talked to some folks. Um, uh, the the reason that should be the case uh, doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything that resembles factorization homology to me, other than it's some complex whose zeroth homology agrees with scan modules. You know. Yeah, yeah, that that I, that should be flaw homology of the uh, yeah. B yeah. of G. Well, I, I'd love to to talk about that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't know if that's true, let alone why, but, but that seems to be what others in the community expect. Uh, David, I have a more yeah. elementary questions. Um, this integral uh, over M3, uh, will, I, I wonder, you, you said this is go beyond the alpha version, but I, I, I wonder, I I don't know when uh where is it really go beyond the alpha version uh if you don't do not do the uh de looping can you integrate the the rap g uh the q uh, finite dimensional q uh directly over some kind of a uh two manifold uh yeah yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe a two manifold time times r or something. Right, so to, to make it a three dimensional, yeah. So, um, may, maybe a first part of your your question is that. So we still see a D loop here. Yeah. So why doesn't alpha cover this case as well? And note that it's this is a three manifold, and this is the twofold D loop. Mm -hmm. So this this is just the next degree of the in the beta direction. It's a E2 monoidal one category that we're integrating a three over a three manifold. It's not an E3 algebra. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, so um, if, if you oh. trace, if you trace through the definition that I outlined of this, um, really, this is a theory of decorated graphs in a manifold. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I I yeah. I I, yeah, I noticed I, the difference, but I didn't realize that that's the key point. <laughs> I see. Uh -huh. Yeah. I have another question. So this rep q g uh final dimensional it, it not only braided uh but also it's a module tensor category, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh this uh, S and T T module modularness will play a role here. Yeah. So, um, in a couple of ways. One is that uh, I mentioned that this is for a frame three manifold, mm -hmm. and it could in fact be taken to be oriented. Mm -hmm. That's a small point. Uh, um as a, a, another paper that we posted about a year ago, this, the, the every braided, rigid, braided monoidal one category has an action of um, the base loops of SO3. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in fact is essentially trivial in this case. Um, mm -hmm. To see that one can use the, the modular, that it's a modular tensor category. And for that reason, that for that mm -hmm. reason, um, one can define this on oriented manifolds. Not so it doesn't use the framing, but that uh -huh. that's a that's a super so that's one comment. But it's it, it's a more superficial, a much more interesting feature of this. Is that because it's a spherical? Because the trivialness is due to the sphericalness, a yeah. spherical structure. Yeah. That's okay. right. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank. You. Yep. Uh, but so much more interesting about the modular tensor category aspect of this 
is that this theory can be defined on four manifolds. It can be extended to four manifolds. Oh. Yeah. I don't I don't have much to say up to, so you know it, it, essentially the center of this three category is, is sorry uh this three category is dualizable over its center and because of the because it's a modular tensor category and that's that's very interesting, and so we can interpret this as the state space of a four dimensional theory, and mm -hmm. um, that that's a bit outside of strictly as of factorization homology. Uh, more specifically, fact I don't expect factorization homology to capture that four dimensional theory. Uh, I see. I see. Uh, um, so this SL two D. So this is SL two D acts on the scheme module in that case. Say that again, SL2C or SL2? So, yeah, as SL2C, this modular, uh, modular group acts on this uh, scan module, this yeah. H0 of this. Is it the consequence of the module tensor category? Um, right. I So I, I've thought a little bit about that and, and I'll, I'll share my. Um, <laughs> I'll say some words, and I, I just to be kind of generous. I, I don't know exactly what that that uh, that structure has to do with factorization homology over a three manifold, but over mm -hmm. a, over a two manifold. Um, so the the framed frame diffeomorphisms of the two torus, mm -hmm. uh, it maps to. Uh, the oriented diffios oriented of the two torus, <clears throat> which is um, SL2Z uh, semi direct product uh, T2. Mm -hmm. So, as a continuous group, that's what it is. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're, and, and this turns out to be the braid group. On three strands, semi-direct product, um, the two torus, and you know there's a class. The braid group on three strands B of it is the universal cover of B SL2. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and this acts on uh, the factorization homology of alpha story of rep wow. Q. Uh, SL, uh, of G, uh -huh. um, finite dimensional, and again that orient that feature of modularity in particular, just that it's an oriented theory, um, mm -hmm. gives an it extends that action, uh, in particular, producing an action of SL two. I see. So, um, so I I think that modularity comes up as the uh, as the value of this theory on the two torus, um, uh -huh. and and if you so so for lens spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Scheme of lens spaces, you might see a shadow of the automorphisms of a splitting of a Higgard splitting of it. I see. Um, I see. But I, so anyway, I, I'm just sharing my thoughts for for how to. I, I see. I see. I see. I don't know if this is the right thing to say. Okay. Okay. Can can, can you prove that H zero is finite dimensional? Oh uh, yeah, right. So my colleague here at Montana State is Sam, Sam Gunningham, and uh -huh. who was involved with the paper that no doubt you're aware of and referring to there. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And, and uh, uh, so I, I this perspective on uh, scan modules, I don't think contributes logically. I think it's like orthogonal to finite uh -huh. dimensional audio scan modules. But uh -huh. uh, Sam uh, seems convinced that the same theory that they use for in their paper for finite dimensionality of scan modules uh -huh. uh, is so good that it also implies that actually this entire chain complex here uh -huh. is finite dimensional.
you, you know, oh, it, I the, the, so Sam, uh, I, you know, we're enthusiastically talking about that project presently. Um, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, is this question. Q generic or root of unity? Yeah, th thanks for that question as well. And that definitely generic. Um, Semi simplicity uh -huh. is, is super important here uh, for the, you know, the, like the rigidity assumptions that are abound. Mm -hmm. um, there, there would be an interesting, um, you know, for for tilting modules, um, I think that that's also uh, I, I maybe I shouldn't say too much. Um, yes, Q, Q is generic here for this mm -hmm. statement. And M is uh, uh, assumed to be closed. Uh, thanks. Uh, M, yeah, M is a any compact manifold with boundary for this statement. Oh, then probably SL2Z can act on, let's say, T2 cross I. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see, I had another example, but um, I think given the time, I'm going to skip that. I I, I would like to... Um, I, I don't know, we, we're quite over time. Um, uh, my plan, my intention was to to name some features of factorization homology that make it computable and easy to work with as opposed to referencing the definition. Uh, and this is analogous, as some of you may know, in algebraic topology between the einlenberg steenrod axioms for homology. Uh, and with those, you can compute homology on just about everything. Uh, and you don't even have to need to know the definition of factorization homology to do those computations. So uh, with my collaborators, we establish some features for a factorization homology that essentially characterize it, similar to the Eilenberg's theorem axioms. So um, I, I think maybe what I'd like to do is, um, if there, uh, and Liang, you can give me some input here, is to talk about those features and give an example of something that you can construct from just those features without knowing any of the values. Does that seem like a reasonable arc for the remainder of the talk? That might be 10 minutes. Sorry, I mute myself. Uh, don't worry too much about the time. If you prefer to talk about it, I, I mean, if the, anyone wants to leave for lunch, uh, that's okay. But, you know, I, I will stay as long as you uh, want to talk. You uh, know, I, I also... I also wish to listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it okay for you? Because I, yes. if you want to go home early, then um, we can stop. You can stop then. Oh, that, that works for me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I will not be offended if, if people need to move on with their days. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So, <laughs> um, okay. So here's some features of factorization homology, and uh. One is that the value on Euclidean spaces is something familiar. The value on RK is K endomorphisms of the special point. So in a sense, uh, these values are the um, are the like co-dimension K topological operators. Uh so sorry, can you remind me about the R again? R is the infinity n category, right? K is something smaller than n. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So this is yeah. like it's, it's for all k less than or equal to n. Okay. Um, this is true. So, uh, so in other words, on R uh, zero, um, that's the moduli space of objects of R, and on R n. This is the n endomorphisms of R, or uh, in R of the unit. And that was the en algebra mm -hmm. that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that's the co-dimension zero or point uh, observables are this yeah. are this EN algebra. So that that's one, uh, and this is a, a theorem. It's not a definition. Um, and I'll mention some others that are pretty easy. So functoriality in R. That's probably not surprising to anybody. There's two kinds of functorialities in the manifold. And I'll give an example demonstrating the utility of both of these functorialities in a second. Given an open embedding, that determines a map between these values of factorization homology. Um, and just to note, uh, here is where the point in R is being used in particular. Uh, in a sense, if you have a if you have a um, disk stratification of M and an embedding of it into a larger one, you just extend by the unit everywhere. Uh, another functoriality is that it's oppositely functorial in proper fiber bundles. So here's where we're really going to use uh, that we're interested in, in values where this has dimension. Often this will have dimension equal to n, whereas this will have dimension less strictly less than n. And that gives a map the other way. Uh, and this is kind of like degeneracies or identities. This is kind of like this. This captures, in some sense, the anti-collision uh, moves. And more functoriality in R is that factorization homology is continuous. So um, somehow this, I think, comes across as rather innocuous. This last bullet. And yet, it just reflect on constructions of, for instance, um, uh, derived zero invariance or rest you can derive um, invariance, where one picks a triangulation of a manifold in order to define the invariant. And in doing so, it makes it essentially impossible to have a continuous action of the diffeomorphisms of M. So, so here's this is really an advantage of this approach, namely that one does not choose any triangulations or anything like that of M uh, in order to define factorization homology. An advantage is that it, there's this manifest continuous action of diffeomorphisms, and this is something I'm I'm quite curious about is um, what this results in, even if one is only interested in H0, one can produce elements in H0 from negative degree elements in the, essentially the skein module and positive degree elements in diffeomorphisms. Um, so, so like when R is like one, these like the one form symmetries that result from uh, this continuous action here, um, smear out negative one dimensional elements in this chain complex to get zero dimensional elements in the skein module. Um, and indeed, it's expected that uh, factorization homology will often output negative uh, chain complexes that have some, uh, possibly have some co homology in negative degrees. Um, just look at this expression, and uh, you know, typically anamorphisms of objects are concentrated in negative degrees. So I, I think this is interesting, and John nor I have really explored it at this point. Um, the, a couple of you made some comments related to this. Um, uh, there's a type of Fubini theorem for factorization homology. 
that the value on a product over a product manifold can be figured out by first integrating over one of the factors. And that naturally is an N minus dimension of it, capital N category, which can then be input into factorization homology over this man of M manifold. Um, and so the right-hand side here indeed makes sense. And uh, this is another theorem. It's not straight from the definitions. And of the theorems I've mentioned so far, the uh, these ones, this is this one is among the harder ones. And then there's a local to global principle. For those familiar with the alpha version of factorization homology, this might look familiar. It's excision. So if you're given a manifold and a splitting of it, that determines a computation of factorization homology over the ambient manifold as a uh, as this expression. And whatever this expression means, I hope that you, just by looking at it, can appreciate that uh, the left-hand side only depends on the value on these pieces of the manifold. So this is a way of computing the value on the whole manifold in terms of the pieces. Um, and in order to make sense of this expression, I'll just kind of say it's a it's a co-end indexed by this one category uh, because this common boundary here has uh, co-dimension one. Uh, and as so this is a right module for it, and this is a left module for it. <clears throat> and then finally, there's the Merida invariance that I already mentioned. And with, with these features, uh, one can work with factorization homology, only taking these as axioms and not having to know the definition. Uh, but that's a paradigm that I, I believe is the case. Um, I'll illustrate uh, an application of this. Uh, David, uh, I have a, a question. So. I, I forgot the 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 setting for R again. Um, it's it's a, a inf, infinity n category, but you you assume rigidity, you assume a monoidalness, right? Uh, thanks. So, uh, R, I, I didn't reset it because I want to understand the what the meaning of Marita, uh, between okay. R and yeah, R prime. Yeah. yeah. So here, um, R, R is a pointed. Uh -huh. rigid and, and I haven't fully said what rigid is infinity n category enriched over v which let's just say is chain complex is over c okay so there's no monoidal structure but, uh -huh. but maybe the, the term rigid I'll, I'll say what that means um, rigid that, that means all the morphism are, are dualizable are adjointable a joint joint, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. so then what do you mean by Morita equivalence, I, I wonder? Yeah, okay. Uh, means, I'll just write this for those. Uh, so each K-morphism mm -hmm. has both a left and a right adjoint. And as I commented earlier, um, BA is rigid if and only if A is rigid mm -hmm. um, monoidal category. And that's a, a, as a two category. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that, that's why it's a generalization of that. That's why that term is used. Uh, I'll say what Merida invariance means. Um, Um, so, uh, definition 
uh, let r0, r1 be as above. So there are n categories, in, you know, infinity n categories that are rigid and pointed. Um, a r0, r1 by module is a V enriched functor, V linear functor, R0 1 op uh, cross R1 to cat infinity n minus 1 of V, uh, you know, enriched in V. And uh, you know these can be so coand defines composition of such. So given a R zero R one by module and an R one R two by module, you can take the, a coand over the intermediate R one to get an R0, R2 by module. And we'll say that R0 and R1 are Morita equivalent. If, um, you know, there's uh, an R0, R1 and an R1, R0 pair of by modules to implement equivalences. Is that answering that that question? Uh, sorry, sorry, I was I muted myself. Um, so I think I you answered my question, but I have a uh, another question. Is that uh, this seems uh, if R zero R one is the uh, uh, de looping of uh, a monoidal category, then it re recovered the euro notion of Morita equivalence, right? Yep. I see. Mm, yeah, looks like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And one, one. Uh, this is related to my earlier comment about perf and algebraic K theory. Um, there's this interesting. Um, there's the you know in for one category is there's uh, item potent completion. Um, mm -hmm. And and here here's a, a thing that's true about. I'll, I'll state it for algebras. And um, and just kind of let your imagination uh, uh, develop how it could be true for uh, higher categories. So if A um, and B are algebras, um, A uh, a B by module which is uh, an a B by module is the same so M is this exact same thing as a continue as a um, uh, color preserving functor from a modules to B modules. Uh, so this is kind of a representability. It's it's rather tautological, but it's a representability of um, of uh, uh, by modules. So note that these are like E one uh, uh, monoidal vector spaces, mm -hmm. and these are um, one or in, even infinity one categories over vector or that are enriched over vector spaces mm -hmm. so we can represent by modules as functors between categories this is kind of one motivation for considering categories not 
algebras. Mm -hmm. um, and furthermore, it follows from this. Um, I'll just say, therefore, um, A is Morita equivalent to B if and only if perf A is equivalent, not Morita equivalent, but equivalent mm -hmm. to B. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is kind of like the alpha story, and this is the beta story, which is, is mm -hmm. somehow uh, better. Yeah. Uh -huh. And there's a similar um, discussion in the higher categorical setting for what perf is and uh -huh. could be and stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just using those features that I mentioned about factorization homology, one can construct the Jones polynomial. One doesn't have to know the definition of factorization homology one can just use those features together with the computation I mentioned of skein modules. So here's how that goes. Given a framed link in R3, so by that I mean it's a you know a compact one-dimensional submanifold equipped with a trivialization, a null homotopy of its Gauss map. Then given a framed link one can construct this span of manifolds. So here's R3, here's R2 cross the link. And using the framing of the link, then there's an embedding of this little thickening, this R2 thickening of L into R3. Uh, also, there's just a projection of R2 cross L onto R2. And I mentioned those peculiar, um, those peculiar functorialities in the manifold. One is opposite with respect to proper fiber bundles. This is one such. It's a fiber bundle and it's proper because L is compact. So one gets a map like this on factorization homology. And it's covariantly functorial with respect to open embedding. So one gets a map like this. Therefore, a composite map. The value on R2, um, and gosh, I, I just saw I'm um, kind of messing up the, this was um, for rep um, B2 of rep Q, G. Mm -hmm. finite dimensional. And so this is the, if you keep track, so the value on R2, uh, where the two endomorphisms of the point, which was the moduli space of objects um, of rep QG. So this is the moduli space of um, rep of, uh, of finite dimensional modules for that quasi-triangular Hopf algebra. And similarly, the value in R3 are the one endomorphisms of the unit in, in uh, rep Q G, which in the case of SL when G, this little SL2, and more generally even, um, the endomorphisms of the unit is rational functions. So this composite on factorization homology through these calculations on Euclidean spaces determines a way of assigning to every <clears throat> finite dimensional um, representation of little SL2 a rational function. And that that agrees with the Jones polynomial. Specifically, when you evaluate on the fundamental representation, you literally get the Jones polynomial. So I hope this illustrates that 
how to use those features, at least to get something familiar without having to know the definition of factorization homology. It also demonstrates the utility of both of these kinds of morphisms between manifolds. Um, other features is that there is now a excision formula for fact for skin modules. So, which... Sorry, can I can I ask a question? Uh, uh, these uh, framed link uh, um, it is not like uh, uh, um, in the rest of the area of uh, theory. You you decorate the link by certain object in, in the representation, but in order to, to get the Jones polynomial, you you somehow uh, need to sum up all the all the possible labels, right? Uh, let's see. In order to get the Jones polynomial, I don't I don't think you you need to sum up all the labels. Uh, if I'm well, following the Jones polynomial needs other colors. That's right. Yeah. The Jones only okay. need the C two for the, the fundamental representation. Oh, oh only need this. Uh, I see. I see. Yep. Yep. That's right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so so this actually answered my question. I I sent uh, the, the some days ago. I sent an email to you. I I, I was wondering how to compute this. Yeah. So oh, I think it, you answer you simply answer that question by saying that uh, okay, in order to do this, you cannot you cannot use the alpha version. You you can do it in the beta version of the factorization of the homology, right? Right. Basically, that is that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I actually very I got your email by the way. Uh, oh really? Okay. Uh, I got an email about the uh, the seminar. Uh, yeah, I have an early email. Okay, oh, I, I, I'll, I'll resend you, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, and I'll just mention a couple of more things. So uh, there, uh, a student of David Jordan, um, I forget her first name, last name Cook, uh, has, Um, some work on uh, skein modules that that <clears throat> show essentially you have right exactness um, of skein modules um, that uh, suggest that excision should be true for for skein modules. And what was missing, of course, is a derived theory of skein modules to account for um, you, you know to fill in the rest of that right exactness to a long exact sequence. So I'm just going to leave it at that, that uh, one gets from this a excision formula for skein modules. And as I already mentioned, one gets a diffeomorphism action on skein modules, which I think would be pretty interesting for constructing elements and, and um, for constructing skeins. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think I'm going to stop there. There's um, anyway, there, there's some other things that I, I had prepared that you know, we could have another time in some discussion more informally with some of you. So thanks so much mm -hmm. for your long attention of two hours. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Uh, OK. Happy to answer some questions if there are any more. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank the speaker for a uh, very a very uh, exciting talks. Um, are there any questions? So will you be able to use excision to compute uh, the factorization homology for, uh, let's say, a closed three manifolds as a result of link surgery? Um, certainly. I mean, in principle, yes. Mm. To actually compute it. Um, <laughs> think would be involved uh, and uh, yeah so for computing some of these values for lens spaces it's something that I've considered a bit mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's you know that's a place to start for that but yeah it, it gives an approach for sure uh, especially if one is truncating the values of, like if one is only wanting to know um, h0 of these mm -hmm. values then um, then I, I think it would be fun to work out computations for lens spaces. Okay. So in particular, if you choose a, a, a modular um, tensor category, 
using this beta version uh, of extracellular homology, you can uh, recover all the rest taken to our EF TQFT, right? The, the, I mean, the, the value of the rest taken TQFT on any uh, three manifold with embedded coupon or, or links. Yes, that that's the idea. You can you can definitely do that. Yeah. Yes. And and from from your theory, that's that is that the a tautological consequence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I see. Yeah. So what what's the difficulty construct of this uh, forty TKFT you briefly mentioned that the. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The whose boundary is is really this rustic into life. Yeah. It's it's more like I. The difficulty is that it's just not the value on a four manifold will be a map between mm -hmm. vector spaces. It it won't. Yep. Whereas the value of by factorization homology on a four manifold will be like a chain complex or something. Um, uh -huh. So it, it just doesn't fit. It, it, it's just not literally describable by a factorization homology. That, that's just a um, comment that like one needs to do some <laughs> something else. Um, uh, and there, there's an interesting, uh, so a lot of inspiration can be drawn by, by looking at much lower dimensions. So uh -huh. uh, it, like for instance, in dimension, one so for one categories um, one can look at the fact that a theory of factorization homology over one manifolds for one categories and the output is chain complexes now mm -hmm. with suitable finiteness conditions on a one category specifically that it's azumaya uh, namely that mm -hmm. it's is dualizable both as a, a module for the unit and as a bimodule for itself and that's an extremely strong finiteness condition. Uh, but if you have a monodal category that's Azumaya, then mm -hmm. that, then, then in particular, it's dualizable over its center. And it, its center is a is a two category. Mm -hmm. So one can evaluate its center on two manifolds. In particular, two manifolds with boundary, and there's a theorem, and this, so one can can, can prove a theorem for two-dimensional factorization homology, that um, that the value on a surface with boundary, with coefficients in the center, is the same as the value of factorization homology on the boundary with coefficients in the original monodal category. Mm -hmm. And and that calculation, which is a non-trivial calculation, uh, is de determines the a, a linear map uh, given a, a two-dimensional cobordism. It determines a linear map. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. um, so the difficulty, you know, I, I alluded. So, so the the difficulty is proving uh, a version of that theorem I just mentioned. But for higher dimensions, specifically, given a uh, an infinity a rigid infinity n category, uh, one can consider its center, and that's a n plus one category. And uh, so, first challenge is understand in practical terms what it means for your mm -hmm. original for R to be dualizable over Z of R at center. And mm -hmm. then second challenge is to prove that similar theorem that factorization homology over a cobordism N plus one manifold mm -hmm. with coefficients in Z of R um, is equivalent with um, the value on, you know, the incoming boundary dual tensored with uh -huh. The value on the outgoing boundary. I see. Uh, so so. The, anyway, so um, I don't know practical conditions in higher dimensions. I see. For checking that Isomaya condition, like uh -huh. essentially, I have no examples, and 
i.e. Uh -huh. suspect modular tensor categories provide such examples, but I, I don't know how to check that. And then, I see. And then again, that second challenge was is how to, is like how to prove that theorem I mentioned, which, mm -hmm. um, which uh, by the way, is in the case of a cobordism from the empty manifold to itself is an instance of Morita invariance. So that more general theorem is some like a relative version of Morita invariance. And uh, that would be an interesting thing to compute, uh, like probably the most interesting thing to compute about the general theory of factorization homology. <clears throat> Thanks for that question. I see. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? So, so in your uh, talk, I think you talk about uh, closed and uh, and open manifolds like iron or closed manifolds freely. Is there any technical difference between dealing with open and closed manifolds? Um, uh, uh, yeah, that that's a that's a good and important question. So I I think it's actually um, Uh, it's most can, it's easiest to work entirely with compact stratified spaces, <laughs> okay, of dimension okay. plus three for the n. Now, given a non-compact manifold, uh, one can compactify it to a manifold with corners or something like that. Okay. Now. That is not always possible if you have like some infinite genus surface type phenomena. Mm. So, so one can just restrict to finite, suitably finite Terry non compact manifolds, which are uh, manifolds that admit compactifications to a, a compact. Um, that's, that's the nicest place to work, I think. And that's actually where we work. <laughs> I don't know if that is addressing the kind of issues that you had in mind. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that, that's fine. I, I was just uh, wondering. Um, so in your um, so you're pro proposing a, I think a, a proposing a, a formal uh, a studying factorization homology uh, in an axiomatic way or using their formal property, right? But and uh, you list the first property is the Euclidean property with R n. Uh -huh. Okay, right. But uh, then you then you talk about closed manifolds with uh, boundaries. So I was thinking yeah, about yeah. interaction. So, so like one can really interpret that as DK rel with rel mm. boundary. You know? I see. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Th mm -hmm. uh, but with boundaries, uh, I probably didn't. Uh, I. Uh, did, did you mention the, uh, what if you have the boundary, uh, what kind of a boundary condition you... Right, what, yeah. What, 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 what that be... Uh, In a sense, that's what you label by the unit. So uh -huh. so for a closed disk, uh -huh. one can choose a triangulation of it. Yeah. And then when looking at the, at the labeling conditions, these can be arbitrary, alpha, beta, et cetera. Uh -huh. Out here, it's always the unit on the boundary. Um, it seems that you can definitely generalize this, right? Yes. To include more. Yep, some kind of relative for sure. Yeah, I and I think that would be a fun thing to think through is um, the the general defect type picture, right? Bulk yeah. and or, or like bulk and boundary action. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that would be yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, excuse me. Uh, is is this factorization homology for the scan uh, module related to the uh, Havandov homology? Um, yeah, that's um, I I like that question also. Um. Uh, my, I, I'm not the expert to talk with about that. I'll I'll say briefly what I do know. Um, so, 
uh, Coven cohomology, uh, maybe as you know, is expected to be a four-dimensional theory. Uh, it's a, expected to be a four-dimensional theory characterized by its point, line, and surface operators, and 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 not nothing nothing else. And um, uh, I so to match that with factorization homology, one would expect for there to be a braided monoidal two category. So the, the total categorical level adds up to four there, right? An E2 monoidal two category. Um, and, uh, and, and surely such a thing would be a categorification of the E2 monoidal one category of, of quantum representations. Um, so, uh, so in order to recover Coben homology as an instance of factorization homology, I, I think that project is really a project of constructing a braided monoidal two category that categorifies rep QG. And, and that's not, so, so once that is constructed, then I, I suspect Coben homology could be an instance of factorization homology. But constructing that categorification, I, I know some people are thinking about it uh, very much. And the last I heard the status of that, it was you know still just the shadow of that has been developed um, by um, there's a one community, uh, Aaron Maselge, one of my collaborators, uh, Paul Bedrick, um, Catherine Katerina Stropel, um, and then another community. Uh, of uh, comprised of um, uh, Rokier and 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 some others. So anyway, I there, there's there's some people working that out, and I don't have too much to say about what that categorification of rep QG would look like exactly. Well, I think uh, Aaronoda has a paper uh, on categorifying the uh, quantum SL two. Probably that's related. Uh, fit into a picture, I mean. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I I guess I am, that, that's right. I, I can't remember what the, the status of that is, namely if there is a braided monoidal two category of such, or if there's just a description of what the objects in there are. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the, for, for the great comments. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? It looks like we have too many questions today. <laughs> uh, thank you. Be be patient or, with our questions. Oh, Any yeah, other sure. questions? Uh, I think yeah, it's a great opportunity to to ask question um, about factor and homology uh, to to the co-founders of the subject, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, actually, I have a lot of questions. Uh, I, I sent an a, a email to you uh, some times ago, but uh, uh, perhaps you didn't uh, receive it. I, I'll do that uh, later, maybe I'll send you another one. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, maybe I'll organize my questions uh, in my emails uh, uh, because I have too many questions. I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Actually, I invite oh. uh, a video call together. Um, oh, yeah, I that might. I mean, you know, it, it depends, but that could be more efficient than email exchanges. So, um, oh, I'll leave that oh. up to you. Uh, but yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Any other questions from from the audience? Is uh, this recording available at the same URL? Oh yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, yeah we will make it available. I think uh, we have a YouTube channel, so we, we I will announce it uh -huh. to, in the group, and uh, I'll uh, let it down uh, announce it in other groups. I see. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank fantastic. you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if 
if there's no further questions, let's thank the speaker again for this wonderful talk. Thank you very I, much. I really learned a lot from you. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much.